Hey there, so today we're going to look at how computers work with numbers, specifically decimal numbers. I mean, people find them difficult enough to cope with, so how does a computer manage? Let's find out. People find maths hard, but computers don't seem to have a problem. Here's something that would be pretty difficult to work out on paper, but even the cheapest calculator spits out an answer immediately. So what makes it difficult? The result contains a decimal place, and they're tricky to deal with. You might have learnt binary at some point by being shown a table like this, and told wherever there's a 1, you add up the place value to get the number. These are integers, whole numbers, but the answer to 22 over 7 is irritatingly 3.1428 and so on. These are known as floating point numbers. How are floating point numbers represented in a computer? That particular rabbit hole is not the topic of this video. I could make a video on that if you want, but tell me in the comments. It's very weird. The short version is the CPU in a modern machine is equipped with a coprocessor called a floating point unit that handles these types of calculations. Magic is involved and we'll just leave it there. So what's this video about then, if not floating point numbers? Well, CPUs in the 80s and 90s didn't often come with a floating point unit, and yet they could still calculate fractional numbers. How come? Today, we're looking at the world of fixed point arithmetic and how to represent numbers with decimal places without using a floating point unit. I'm learning how to write code for the Spectrum next. As I figure more things out, I make videos about them. It helps me understand it, and I figure other people might find it useful too. And if you look down in the bottom of the YouTube thing, there's a playlist of everything I've done so far. But now that I've covered some basics, what I want to do is progress into maybe making a game of some description. So now what I need to start looking at is some of the more difficult and advanced techniques that there are. A lot of these techniques are about 30 odd years old, and while they're not that difficult once you understand them, any of the information about them has been lost over time, or it's buried away in forum posts somewhere that you just have to hope you come across. Were you a game dev back in the day? Do you have war stories about this kind of coding? If you do, tell me down in the comments. It's quite interesting seeing what it was like back then. You know, I was just a kid playing these games. So this is my chance to actually kind of take part, as it were. If you look at how to make games, you'll notice the fun feeling games are where the motion of the sprites feels more realistic, as if the characters have weight or inertia to them. Adding things like inertia and a feeling of realism isn't too hard, the code isn't that difficult. Here you can see some from that rather excellent Game Mechanics Explorer website. But if you look through the code, what you'll notice is it's dealing with acceleration and it's using sine and cosine and the rotation of the ship and multiplying it by acceleration. All of this is going to result in numbers that are not whole numbers. That's what sine and cosine do, they have a number between 0 and 1. So we can't represent that easily using just integers. We need a new way of doing this. Those floating point numbers are kind of our enemy. They're slow to calculate without a floating point unit. The Z80 CPU in the Spectrum Next can't handle those. It can only work with integers. So if we want to write code using decimal numbers, we somehow need to do the job of the floating point unit by hand using our own code. But as anyone who's used an emulator knows, replicating hardware using software is very slow. Now I know what you're thinking, okay? The Spectrum, back in the day, had no problem with dividing 22 by 7. It did come out with 3 point whatever. But it was doing that using its own routines, which, because it's basic, was designed to make it very easy to write code. But the kind of trade-off with that is that it used some CPU time, to do that calculation. That's the very thing we're trying to avoid. We want to make really fast routines to deal with small, uh, like less than zero numbers, so that if they're being used a lot in a piece of code, the calculation of that doesn't slow down the machine more than anything else the machine is trying to do. So how do we deal with numbers like 3.14 if our machine can only use integers or an approximation of them that is really slow? Like, I could annoy all the mass people and just say pi is 3, and kind of hope it's close enough. But then there's other things like vectors where you do need small numbers multiplied by big numbers or using sine and cosine. So what we need is a different way of doing this. 
So to deal with numbers that contain decimal points, what we need is some sort of trick. To explain it better, let's think about some money. So I'm English and this is our money. Okay, we have pound coins, then we have two p's and five p's and one p's and a couple other things in here, but there we go. There's an amount of money. So in our shops, we either see prices written as pounds and pence, you might see something as £3.99, or if the shop's been a bit strange, it might just do it in pence. We know which is which, we can figure it out, it's not that difficult. Everyone understands it, we know that if we have £3, that's the same as 300 pence, and that if we have 3p, that's like 0.03 pounds. The conversion is very straightforward. All you do is you multiply the value in pounds by 100 to convert it to pence, and then you divide it by 100 to convert it to pounds. But then another way to think about this is that if you've got £3.99, to convert it to pence, you're not doing any division or multiplication. All you're doing is moving that full stop two positions to the right. And if you're turning it from 399 back into £3.99, you're just moving it two positions to the left. 8-bit CPUs can't do multiplication, but they can do shifting, and that's the trick that we're going to use. And if we group things into groups of 8 instead of 10, we can work with this quite easily. So what we're trying to do is convert something like 3.14 into a whole number without losing the 0.14 part. This is called fixed point arithmetic or fixed point maths. It's quite an old technique. Um, I first learnt about it when I was looking at how to program on the Game Boy Advance and the full explanation to it is on my website down below. I'm going to go through a simple explanation of how this works so you can see it. But first we need to look at how we even store binary numbers. When we use fixed point maths we have to make a trade-off between the amount of accuracy we want and the range of numbers that we're storing. I'm going to use what's known as 8.8 .8 fixed point maths, which just means there's 8 bits for the whole number and 8 bits for the sort of decimal part. Although it's not really decimal, it's in binary. But we'll get mixed up with all these terms as we go along, but it'll make sense. If you've ever been taught binary and done a basic sort of binary number line, you'll know they look like this. So this is a basic 8-bit binary number line. And to convert any number into binary, all we have to do is work out kind of how much that number goes into each one of these. So if I've got 42, I know it's going to be because 32 add 8 add 2 is 42. So that's just the same as any like how we count as how you've been taught as kids. Like you'll have done a units, tens, hundreds, thousands. So that is 1, that is 10, that is 236, because it's 2 hundreds, 3 tens, 6 units. It's the same sort of thinking. Unlike base 10, representing negative numbers is different. Like with this, we just put a stick there, and that's it, it's minus 236. But in binary, if we look at our number line again, there's no way of encoding negativeness in this. You could have an extra box at the end for saying whether it's positive or negative, but if you go down that rabbit hole, it's called sign and magnitude, you'll find it has its whole strange set of problems. You can do a video on that if you want, tell me. It's very, very weird compared to anything else. There's like two versions of negative and positive zero. So instead, to convert a number into negative, we use a thing called two's complement, which is where you take the thing, you invert all the bits, then you add one. Okay, so 1101010 should be minus 42. Now we're not dealing with negative numbers. This is just an example of how the bits in the bytes don't have a specific meaning. It's up to us to know that this is a signed number and that it's not a positive number that is 128 plus 64 plus 16 plus 4 plus 1. The clever thing is the math still works. It's all the same. So this is quite useful, okay? The idea that the bits that we're using don't have to be a specific pattern of 1, 2, 4, 8, and so on. There can be other things. We're going to use that to make our own number system. So let's make up our own number system where we invent a new number line that has a binary point 
and binary fractions, because we're working in base 2. So first, how do fractions work in base 10? Well, if you wind your mind back to school, and this is a retro channel, so you shouldn't have to go too far back in your mind, you'll have learnt that number lines are like this for whole numbers. Okay, so we've got units, tens, hundred, thousand, and so on. Now, if you put a decimal point here, then we've got tenths and hundreds and thousands and so on. It follows the same pattern, okay? Dividing by 10 each time, multiplying by 10 each time. So if we think like this, but use 16 bits and binary instead, we can make a new number line. So the first eight bits can be for the whole number part. Now we have another eight bits. So if we put an imaginary binary point here, this is fake, it's not a thing, it doesn't exist. It's just helping us understand those two eight bit positions. We can now make up our own fractions. And because it has to follow the same pattern, we're going to have half, quarter, eighth, sixteens, thirty twos, sixty fours, and 128, and then because there's an extra bit to use, we get 1, 2, 56. This is called 8.8 .8 fixed um, numbers. You can do anything you want. You could have 4.12. You could have 1.15 if you wanted very accurate numbers between 0 and 1. It's up to you as a programmer to decide this stuff. So if we're using this system and want to do the number 42, well, if we wrote the bits out here, it would be inaccurate. So what we have to do is write all the bits out and then shift them to the left 8 bits. Or in other words, multiply it by 256. And if we want to turn it back into an integer again, we just divide it by 256 or shift it to the right. If we're on a Z80, it can deal with 16-bit registers and it can just give you the top half or the bottom half. So we don't even need to do any maths. So in this example, I'm using 256 so that all our whole numbers have 256 fractions in them, in the same way that a pound has 100 pennies. And this fits neatly into the bytes. Now what I've got is a small C macro that does this for me, so this doesn't even require any computation. So far we've dealt with whole numbers, which seems really pointless, like you may as well just use integers and be done with it. The point of fixed point maths is, as I'll show you in a minute, you can represent fractional numbers using a very simple routine. So what I'll do is I'll go through how you convert a number like pi into fixed point maths. And you'll see that it's not accurate, but it's accurate enough, which I know is going to wind up maths people. I'm turning your nice irrational number of pi into 16 bits that are sort of close enough. But it's fine, don't worry. We're on a machine where the screen is 256 pixels across. We're not going to notice if there's like 0.1 of a degree inaccuracy in any of this stuff. So here's how we convert a number like pi, which we'll say is 3.141, it's accurate enough, to fixed point maths. So you have 3.141, you times it by 256, and that gives you 804.096. So we now need to turn that into an integer. This is quite awful that we're about to cut some bits off this number, we're going to lose precision but this will still work out with a reasonably accurate value afterwards. This is like we're taking the floor of the number. So we take 804096 and we convert it to an integer and we get 804. And it just literally snips off the 0 0.096. In binary, that is this long number. And if we split it into two parts of eight, you'll start to notice that part of it looks like it should do. If we now use the number line that we created before to turn this back into a number that we understand, you'll find it works pretty well. So we've got one, two, four, eight, so on. So that bit is three. Then on here we've got halves, quarters, eighths, sixty-fourths. So that is an eighth plus a sixty-fourth, which is 0 0.1406. So we've got 3.1406, which is pretty close, you know? We're like 
point one of a degree off. It doesn't really matter that much, like I said before. So I hope you can see this is quite useful. We can now, instead of using floats and hoping that the floating point library that came with our compiler is efficient, we can bypass the whole thing and we only have a slight inaccuracy with the numbers that are coming out. Remember, I'm trying to make games. I'm not trying to calculate trajectories for things that are flying through the air or anything. A few numbers of inaccuracy is perfectly acceptable. What I can use this for is having a velocity vector for something that's moving around the screen. And instead of it being like the old school games where you had something like Pong, where it moved in very obvious diagonal lines, it can now move in smaller angles. So instead of having a horrible jump mechanic where you sort of jump in a diagonal and it's all pre-programmed, I can have a more interesting jump, like the one in Mario, where he sort of skids around the level a bit. We can also use this trick for trigonometry. Like I want to use sine and cosine so I can do circular motion. Well, the sine calculation is very, very slow. So instead what I can do is calculate a sine table in advance and then just use that and look up values inside it. I've written a bit about that on my website if you go and have a click around it. I'll put a link in the thing at the bottom. And if you've ever watched any demos from like the Amiga or the Atari where their CPUs didn't have floating point units or they did that kind of 3D effect, then all of that will have been done using fixed point maths. There's no way you'd get an Atari ST that can just about cope with full screen animation and playing back music at the same time, also calculating floating point numbers. You're going to cheat as much as possible. So there you go, that's fixed point maths. And hopefully you can see how on a machine that doesn't have a floating point unit, it's quite useful. I'm going to use it whilst I try and figure out what games I'm making. So come back next week when there'll be some sort of unstructured coding video where I'm just messing about trying to learn new techniques. And then the week after there'll be some sort of more presented video where I show you what I've learned. It's kind of the pattern I'm going for for a bit now. Figure something out and just show you how I do it and then present it properly the week after. Now if you still like the hardware videos, I've got a very rusty GameCube that I need to fix that's in bits, and there's a Pikachu N64, one of those limited edition things, that apparently has had a cup of coffee inside it, so that'll need a little clean. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, just, you know, do the YouTube thing, and I'll see you next week.